Good morning, everyone. You guys look alive? Not really? Well, um, I know we're going to talk about something today that everyone I know is so interested in. That's psychiatry. That's why you became internist. But uh, uh, I just couldn't figure out what I wanted to be for residency, so I decided to do residency in psychiatry and medicine. And... Um, what I tell a lot of people is it doesn't matter which field you go into, what, whether you specialize, whether you do surgery, whatever, I don't care what you do, you can't get away from psychiatry. Uh, if you're going to be a general internist, you certainly won't get away from it. If you're going to be like Dr. Locke and go into, where's Dr. Locke, where'd she disappear? There she is. Um, if she's going to be a GI, a GI a, psychiatry folks tend to just gravitate towards the field of gastroenterology. I'm not sure why. I should talk to Dr. Lesage about it quite a bit. Uh, but you see a lot of things, somatoform disorders, anxiety disorder, irritable bowel syndrome. There's all kinds of things that sort of go along with certain syndromes. So you're going to see it in its various forms. So what I've tried to do with this talk, uh, I used to call it psychiatry made ridiculously simple. Um, so I'm trying to simplify it as best I can, uh, not only for, you know, practice and so forth, but maybe some board uh, tips as well. Um, there's a you know, there's enough on, on your boards uh, that you don't want to miss the question, so I'll try to emphasize those points as well. Uh, I, I've given this talk before, but I've actually made some changes based on some of the things I've seen in the boards, the trends, and just some of the things that I think are really important, especially like anxiety disorders. So I'm going to talk a little bit about anxiety disorders as well. So basically, this is what we're going to try to cover today. These are the objectives. Um, but um, basically depression, mood disorders, things like that, anxiety. Um, my favorite, personality disorders um, uh, and somato somatization disorders, somatoform disorders. Uh, also look at psychiatric medicines. Um, I mean, I don't know where you guys are. If you're at the VA, it's unlikely you'll see a patient who doesn't have a psychiatric medication along with the uh, other medications that they take, the list of 30. Um, at JCMC, Holston Valley, it's the same thing. So it's, it's very rare that you see people who are not on some kind of psychiatric medication. Or the other part of it is you're going to be in a clinic and someone's going to come in depressed or you're going to see different situations where you may be the one treating the depression or even the anxiety. Just quickly look at some of the uh, um, medical issues that may, you know, look like psychiatric illnesses, just to kind of keep, keep your minds open to those kind of things. Um, also talk about some psychiatric referrals uh, and what kind of resources you have in the community. To me, the, one of the biggest things you should, I, I think, whether you take nothing out of this talk from me, is you need, to, you need to know where to send people when you can't take care of the psychiatric issue. So I'm going to try to go over some things like that. So just as a way of introduction, just to sort of emphasize the point about depression, um, it's very prevalent um, in our society. Um, and you can see some of the statistics here. Uh, and one thing to, to note here is that 15% of patients with major depressive disorder kill themselves. Uh, and if you remember from medical school, it's usually older, white male, single, things like that. So those are some things to always remember. It doesn't mean um, that that's the only, those are the only folks. There's a lot of people who, um, you know, make suicidal gestures. They're not necessarily trying to kill themselves. They're trying to get attention. A lot of times, borderline people, but they take lethal overdoses. Um, they'll take a tricyclic antidepressant. 
So those are some things to remember if you've got a patient who's unstable and they're on a tricyclic antidepressant. You may not, if the psychiatrist isn't aware of these things, you should be. Um, so here's a breakdown of females and males. And one of the other points I wanted to make before we move into the, the actual uh, talk, the meat of it, is that 60% of depressed people are anxious. Okay, so there's a you know, high prevalence of anxiety that runs along with uh, depressive disorders. So try to remember that, particularly if you're starting a medication. If you're the one that's going to be starting a medication, which might be the case. So primary care folks uh, tend to be the gatekeepers or the gateway for many psychiatric disorders. You guys will see these folks on the front line. Um, you know, when I was a psychiatry resident, it was basically primary care doctors are going to be treating more depression than I will as a psychiatrist, just simply because you see it. Now, I see depressed folks who are resistant to treatment. I don't typically see the folks who just come in and say, well, you know, I just don't feel all that great or something's happened. It's typically the primary care doctor, so you need to, to identify those folks. You're going to be seeing them. So here's the mood disorders that we commonly see. I commonly see, too. Uh, the major depressive disorder, um, and again, I, I use the term pseudo-dementia. These are people that actually look demented almost. I mean, if someone has very major depression, they can actually look demented. So you have to rule that out too, and we'll talk a little bit about some dementia uh, very briefly, but just to kind of touch on it. Uh, bipolar disorder, which is very, in my opinion, is overdiagnosed. Uh, you're going to see a lot of people who are labeled as bipolar disorder. Um, People are probably sick of hearing me say this, but they're more, more than likely, they're borderline. They're personality disordered. Uh, just because someone's angry all the time and can't control their temper and um, their mom or dad was bipolar doesn't necessarily mean they're bipolar. Now, they may, uh, may be on the medications. Um, so, again, there's a lot of misdiagnose, a misdiagnosis with bipolar disorder. Uh, so-called subclinical depression and also the so-called seasonal affective disorder, dysthymia, and anxiety disorders. We'll go with two. So basically, just to real quickly run, run through this, this is your SIGI caps. And again, this is something you should probably remember. I mean, there's some things I wouldn't ask you guys as, as internists to remember and know. Let psychiatrists do their business. Um, but these are some things I, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't forget the SIGI caps, the whole issue of sleep, weight loss or change in appetite, things like that. Uh, if it gets into, you know, melancholic depression, atypical depression, let the psychiatrist, um, you know, kind of filter that one out. But you should at least know how to identify a major depressive disorder, and I'm, and I'm sure you do. I listed here uh, post-stroke depression, and there's high uh, incidence of, uh, particularly with the left-sided stroke, uh, it's already affecting the left side of the brain. Uh, and depression. So remember that. Actually, I just, I didn't read it, but I just actually ran across an article. I didn't read the whole thing, but I just read an article with, uh, that mentioned something about increased mortality with treating folks with an SSRI uh, with post-stroke depression. I'm not sure exactly uh, what the paper said, but you know, again, there's always things to consider when you're putting anyone on a medication. But I always try to remember when someone has a stroke, what that stroke will do to people, particularly if it's a left-sided stroke, and how that will, you know, may, you know, eventually lead, lead to a depressive episode. And again, bipolar disorder, I, I wouldn't expect anyone here, I mean, I, I don't know how well I do it at diagnosing bipolar disorder, but I do know that to really accurately diagnose bipolar, you probably need a good six months, and you probably need to let them go through a psychotic break. I don't think anyone here, including myself, could diagnose someone with bipolar on the first shot. And I've seen some classic bipolar patients, but even then I'm skeptical. It could be drug-induced. Uh, it could be schizoaffective disorder. It could be all kinds of different things. So, you know, ferreting out bipolar disorder is, is tough, um, but nonetheless you're going to see these people. And what I tend to look for is this decreased need for sleep um, and goal-directed activity. Some of, the, some of the things like, you know, excessive involvement and pleasurable activities, a lot of folks get involved in that with psychiatric disorders or, or not. Um, a lot of folks get in, but, but I always look for grandiosity 
and inflated uh, self-esteem when I'm looking at bipolar disorder. So if you don't see that with a person that you're treating and they're labeled bipolar, they're probably not. Now, this is the, uh, what I call depression, what we used to call depression, not otherwise specified. And this is probably what you'll see a lot. The major, dis the major depressive disorders, if you see someone with major depressive disorder, I'd probably refer them out. Get them, at least get them a counselor uh, and maybe get them seen by psychiatrists, but, but easily let them see a counselor. But if you've got someone who has depression for two weeks but doesn't meet that criteria for major de depressive disorder, meaning they don't have the five criteria, uh, that might be someone you might want to treat. You might want to have a conversation with them, uh, and they may just need therapy. They may just need to go see a counselor. Maybe they need medications. Um, but those are people you'll have to uh, you know, think about. This is the so-called seasonal affective disorder, and again, with the, um, the, the new edition of this Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5, there really is no seasonal affective disorder anymore. It's, it's basically a specifier. So you have someone with major depressive disorder with a seasonal component, okay? Um, and so this is the pattern, and the classic one is the winter-based pattern, the one that I see a lot. I see a lot with my patients. So there's a lot of people who have this seasonal component. And typically what I do with someone who has a seasonal component is around, say, September, October, before the winter comes in, before the days get short and the night and, the, and, and all the things that happen with winter come on, I'll actually bump up their antidepressant. And that tends to work. But you have to really kind of identify that this person has that seasonal component. Um, and so, and here's some, some uh, therapies, um, Paxil, or not Paxil, but uh, Prozac, and the light therapy uh, was shown in a study back in 2006 to be pretty effective, both of them. Uh, but some people can just use the light. Um, some people may already be on a medication. But it's, these are things to remember. Especially, uh, you know, you may have a patient of Dr. Stewart's uh, who has um, diabetes. Um, and Dr. Stewart has sent me some of his patients before. Um, who during the winter months may not take that great, you know, that good of control. They may not have as good a control with their diabetes because they're depressed. They may not want to give themselves injections. They may not care. And I have people who say they don't care um, about what their blood sugars are, but that leads to all kinds of complications when they don't care about their blood sugars. One of my favorite types of people you guys remember Winnie the Pooh, right? I tried to find a picture of Winnie the Pooh, but Walt Disney, man, they've got, they've got the lock and key on all kinds of pictures. Uh, but Eeyore, you guys remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? Uh, the real pessimistic. I mean, Winnie the Pooh is a great story. I mean, whoever, all these cartoons are written for kids, but they're really pretty smart in a lot of ways psychologically. But anyway, but Eeyore was that donkey who just was like, well, oh, everything's gloomy, you know, everything knows nothing's right, and... You know, kind of the, the glass is half empty kind of people, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, basically the gloomy outlook. But these are folks you see that have a lifetime of just, you know, what I would call a gloomy outlook. Uh, very pessimistic types of people, uh, but, it, but at least for two years. But these folks, again, don't meet the criteria for major depressive disorder. Uh, but again, it's something that you should be on the lookout for. Okay, so just because they don't have the, the major depressive criteria doesn't mean they don't have some kind of depressive component, okay? And a lot of these people are probably going to have some personality disorders as well. They're just not going to cope as well with life. So, any questions about the mood disorder component? Anything you guys got any questions about? Okay. This is the anxiety. I added this one this year just because, I mean, I don't know why I didn't. It, I mean, I see anxiety disorders all the time. Um, when I gave the re board review, I included it, and I just I asked myself, why wouldn't I include this in just a simple talk to general internists uh, or residents? Because you, we see this all the time. I mean, I'm, we're talking about anxiety in my clinic all the time. Now, I've got some med psych residents with me, but even, where's Dr. Cochiani? Where is he? Is he here? There he is, right in front of me. Uh, even, even we see uh, anxiety issues all the time. Now, he was lucky he inherited Dr. Guha's patients, so... He had all the good patients, but um, he didn't have my complicated type of patients. But, uh, but anyway, we still nonetheless see anxiety disorders. So 
I just listed some up here. Uh, again, the good old general anxiety disorder. You see that a lot. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety disorder, what we've called social phobia, and then panic disorder. And again, I've, I remember seeing this on my board exam, and I've talked to other folks who've seen these types, types of questions uh, on board exams. And so we'll try to go over these anxiety disorders. And again, I'm not, I don't know that you folks need to treat them, but you need to identify them. Uh, and also, and, and I think the boards want you to be able to at least identify. Um, and uh, we'll, I'll try to go over some things that I think are sort of key components, hallmarks of different anxiety disorders so you can differentiate. Because it's, sometimes it's hard to differentiate. When I, when I know when I took my, you know, internal medicine board, the anxiety question I got, I sat there and looked at it for a long time. It was a tough question. Uh, but it's a question you don't want to miss. So we'll go ahead and do a question here to kind of wake everybody up a little bit, get your brains moving. But it says a 21-year-old woman lives through a tornado that touches down and rips the roof off the grocery store in which she's working. She fears for her life during this event and over the next week develops symptoms of derealization, uh, which basically she's just kind of not really feeling like she's, she's just disconnected from reality is basically what that is. Um, like the world's kind of moving around them and they're not part of it. Um, Emotional numbing, uh, not much in the feeling way, just sort of apathetic. Uh, and amnesia, which is basically dissociative um, for parts of the event. In addition, she develops painful recollections accompanied by anxiety symptoms. Her most likely diagnosis is which of the following? So who says it's panic disorder? Anybody say it's panic? Social anxiety? Just a fear of tornadoes and so being in the grocery store when the tornado's going. Dissociative fugue. You guys remember what dissociative fugue is, by the way? Besides the psychiatry resident. Anybody remember? What? That's, that's, that's kind of what, yeah. Do you remember Anne Hayes? Remember that woman? She was dating Ellen DeGeneres uh, some years back, and she, they ended up finding her walking around Venice Beach not knowing who she was, not knowing where she was, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, they basically they just they go somewhere and they don't remember much. That's a dissociative few. Um, acute stress disorder, any takers on that one? Okay. What about post-traumatic stress disorder? We got one. So why would you say it's acute stress disorder? So we'll, we'll, we'll give you the, we'll say it's, it's some kind of stress disorder, we'll say that. What, what makes it acute versus post-traumatic? That's right. Man, that's pretty good. Yeah, we need to recruit you for psychiatry. We'll get the med psych program going again. She'll be our first recruit. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So if you go back to the question, well, so, well, yeah. So if you go back to the question, it happened within a week. So it's about a week she's having these symptoms. So had she had these symptoms, had she just been okay for, you know, three months or something? and then started, then you call it post-traumatic stress. So that's the difference. Basically, acute stress disorder, post-traumatic again. I wouldn't expect you guys to necessarily treat that, but if you, particularly if you're working in a VA, you probably ought to know what, that's, what post-traumatic stress disorder is. So let's go through, the, through these uh, different things. And again, post-traumatic stress disorder is sort of under the umbrella of uh, anxiety disorders. So basically, when I think of a generalized anxiety disorder, a person who has generalized anxiety disorder, I just think of someone who worries about everything, like what my mom would call a worry ward. Uh, they're worried about whether the kids are going to get to school on time. They're wor they're wor I mean, the, the things that, I mean, you may be worried about getting through residency. That's, that's not, <laughs> that's, that may be normal. That's a normal thing to worry about. Uh, or getting up in the morning to get up or whatever. The things that you have to worry about, there's a reason to worry about. These are things that people have just absolutely no control over and they're worried about it. They're, they're worried that someone's gonna get in an accident. You know, they, they're, you know it's, a, it's a parent who worries that their kid who's traveling uh, across the country is gonna get in some kind of major accident. Now. There's nothing wrong with thinking that kind of thing, but if it's you know, interfering with your life, that becomes a problem. But that's what these folks do. They worry about 
practically everything. And you can get a pretty easy history on some folks like that who do that. And the other part of this is they have these somatic complaints. So if, if you read a question or you're talking to someone and you start asking them, you know, you, know, you get this muscle tension, you get headaches, you get you know, these, these things I'm listing here, uh, that goes towards the way of generalized anxiety disorder. And again, it has to be a six month duration. I mean, anybody can have, anybody can go through any type of thing. It doesn't have to be a psychiatric disorder. And I think sometimes we overemphasize psychiatric disorders. Some people are just, that's just the way their personality is. Uh, but if it's impairing them to a point, then you might look at it as being a problem and a psychiatric disorder. And again, here's the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. You've got to have the stressor event. Um, and again, it could be a motor vehicle accident, uh, some type of abuse as a kid, combat, uh, which we see a lot, domestic violence. But these are some of the uh, things that they'll describe, the flashbacks, feeling like they're actually back at the event. The, the event is actually re recurring again. Hypervigilance. And I guess the best example I have of hypervigilance is I had a friend of mine who was a, a Vietnam War veteran, and he said he used to, when he used to drive down the streets, this is back in Indiana, he would look in the tree lines. That's, that's what he did for a year, 13 months when he was in Vietnam, was drive a tank and look up in the tree lines to see if the enemy was there. So it became hardwired in him, uh, and it's a real hypervigilance. Um, avoidance and numbing. People who, another thing, too, I used to always ask people at the, at the VA, you know, I'd say, hey, do you ever go to Walmart? No, oh, God, no, I'd never go in that place. That place freaks me out. Walmart freaks me out, too, but uh, I don't have PTSD, but I just don't like the energy in that place. But, um, but people who have PTSD will not go. They may go in at 10 o'clock at night, or actually even at 10 o'clock at night, Walmart's crazy, but, uh, but they'll go at 2 in the morning. They'll go when there's nobody around. Um, now, that doesn't mean they have PTSD, they don't go to Walmart, but you see what I'm saying. Uh, just some interesting things about uh, PTSD, just some of the treatments. Again, if someone has PTSD, refer them. Get them, you know, get them to see a psychiatrist. Uh, that's going to need you know, more treatment. But again, it's, it's good to uncover that kind of stuff. You know, you could, you, if you talk to your patients, you might actually uncover that. Find out what their history is in, if you get a good social history. Uh, but this MDMA treatment, uh, I've, just, I've been reading about this, it's basically like ecstasy. Uh, these hallucinogens are starting to be used for, for PTSD. It's actually used in Canada. It's a very controlled situation where they give these folks NMD, MDMA, ecstasy, um, and basically it's used with psychotherapy, but it's supposed to reduce the fear in order to process the trauma. And again, I've seen some results, for, at least from uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, war veterans, uh, and there's, um, you know, they're, they're saying it actually works. It's, you can't cure PTSD. Uh, you can only treat it and do the best you can just to minimize the symptoms that people have. This eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR is just another thing where you know, get exposed to light. Um, again, it's a treatment I really don't understand a whole lot about. I don't, I, it's, it's done over in Asheville. Um, I don't, they don't have anyone certified to do it here. But again, it might be something you'll see if someone says, hey, I'm getting this EMDR. That's what, that's what they're doing, it's PTSD. And again, greater than 30 days after the event. Obsessive compulsive disorder, again, uh, boards and everything like association. So typically if I ever see someone with a tick, you know, some kind of particularly eye movement, weird eye movement, um, which, you know, a tick, those are the most common forms of ticks, uh, facial movements. Uh, that's associated with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, hallmark is intrusive thoughts, repetitive behaviors. Again, the compulsive, the compulsions, the counting, the checking, folks that are perfectionistic, and that kind of goes along with obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Uh, and again, this is marked distress and impairment in functioning. Uh, and there's some pretty radical types of treatment uh, for obsessive compulsive disorder. But again, this is a, this is a, a disease or disorder I would refer out to someone. Okay. I wouldn't try to treat this in my office. Social phobias. Again, these are intense fears in one or more social situations. Typically develops at an early age. I mean, you don't typically develop, you know, when you're, you're in residency, for instance, you don't, get, you don't develop a social phobia. 
uh, you have it uh, early on. Uh, some of the treatments uh, that we see, uh, the cognitive behavioral therapy, some drugs um, could be used as well. Uh, and these are associated with alcohol dependence and avoidant personality disorder. You guys remember avoidant personality disorder? Jack's avoiding me right now by sleeping. Um, who remembers avoidant personality disorder? What, what's sort of the, what's the difference between avoidant personality and someone who has like schizoid personality disorder? Do you guys remember schizoid? They like to be alone, right. And avoidant personality disorder. Beautiful. Sign him up. This guy's a psychiatrist too. So yeah, so you, everyone hear what he says. So basically, the avoidant personality disorder, they would like to be in social situations, but they just can't. They're, they're so anxious about it, what might happen, they, they can't get themselves to do it. The schizoid personality disorder, which I believe me, I've never seen it. They don't come to psychiatrists. <laughs> they don't see anybody. Uh, they're in the mail rooms. You know, they're hidden. Um, uh, Dr. They're like Dr. Kelly. They're, they're hanging out in the dark room somewhere, uh, wanting to avoid people at all costs. I'm just kidding. He's a pretty social guy. Um, but yeah, that's the difference. Uh, but you, but it's, that kind of makes sense, though, right? These social phobics are trying to stay away from people, too, for a reason that because of an anxiety issue. Alcohol dependence too. So, you know, if you got someone that you're treating for alcohol uh, dependence, you may want to investigate a little bit more about what's going on. Maybe they're using alcohol. A lot of times PTSD folks are using it to mask the symptoms. Self-medicating is what, what we call it, okay? And again, if someone has a performance phobia, you could just use a beta blocker. So that's a, it's a simple thing a internist could do, okay? If someone says, hey doc, I got to give this talk, uh, I mean, I took a beta blocker before I came here. <laughs> um, just kidding. Uh, but I've actually done it before. I've actually given some people beta blockers. Um, now, I wouldn't give the beta blocker. I, wouldn't say, I would let them take the beta blocker, you know, as a practice run. I wouldn't give them the beta blocker. So I know cardiologists like to get people's heart rates down to 30 and their blood pressures at 60 over 30, but it's hard to function that way. Um, but... Um, so tell them to take the beta blocker at some point before they give the speech, okay? Or they take the test. I've actually given beta blockers for people who, who have test anxiety, and it's actually worked, okay? So it's something easy to do. I'd give them a low dose of Enderol is what I did, maybe like 10 milligrams of Enderol. It, it seemed to satisfy. And again, I, and I'd say this is probably one you guys see quite often. Okay, where, where do you see the panic, where, where are you going to see the panic, as an internist, where are you going to see the panic disorder most often? In the ER, there you go, Dr. Capillas knows exactly right. So these are folks that come in and they've got all, I mean, they've got, they've got all the hallmarks of, of an MI, but nothing to show for it. I'm sure Dr. Geraci has seen plenty of panic disorder over his career. Um, I, I know Dr. Ramu has referred several folks to me over the years for panic disorder um, who came in. He's ruled them out for everything under the sun as far as cardiac issues um, and ends up being panic disorder. So these are the folks that come in with the intense fear and apprehension, impending death or impending doom. Um, and again, those are the symptoms that you see, the palpitations, the dizziness, shortness of breath, um, and feelings of unreality. So they just, you know, if someone has a panic disorder, they just they, they don't comprehend what's really going on around them, essentially. And remember, these things, they, they begin abruptly and without any provocation. I mean, they, people panic all the time. I mean, I, mean, I panicked this morning at 7.49, or, or, you know, thinking, oh, God, am I going to get here on time? But I had a reason to panic. Um, but these things come out of nowhere. Someone could be somewhere, and all of a sudden, bam, they get hit with this panic attack. Okay? Now, there's panic disorder without agoraphobia, and there's panic disorder with agoraphobia. And so again, the, the agoraphobics are going to be the ones that just stay at home, okay? And those are tough to treat. You know, I had a, uh, an agoraphobic patient once, and um, it was hard to get her to my office um, to treat her. She finally got over it. She had PTSD too, but 
but she had really bad panic. Again, my favorite, what time is it, by the way? Perfect. My favorite personality disorders are the whole slew of them, but uh, these are ones I thought maybe you guys run into. I've, I've talked about these quite a bit, um, but again, it's something worth repeating. These are the folks you're going to see uh, in the hospital settings quite often, even in your clinic. Uh, but again, remember borderline personality disorder just simply because you're going to see their diagnosis a lot of times as bipolar disorder, so don't let it fool you. But these folks are impulsive. They have very unstable relationships. They've been married. Uh, I've said this quite often. These, these are, my, my wife's family has been a, a lesson for me in personality disorders. Uh, I've learned more about personality disorders from my wife's family uh, than I have probably from any patients I've ever seen. They, uh, it, it gave me a, a real you know, advantage <laughs> as a psychiatry resident. Uh, recurrent suicidal behavior. These are, when I say suicidal behavior, these are sort of parasuicidal gestures, kind of like cutting themselves, taking, um, gosh, taking a Benadryl and calling the calling 911 saying, I'm going to kill, I just took an overdose. So that's not, I mean, I'm not saying that's not an overdose. It is, and you should treat it as such, but, but those are more like parasuicidal gestures. Those are more like cries for help. Um, I mean, I've had people say, you know, tell me, I was going to kill myself, and, I, and I, always, I always say, what stopped you? I always ask people, what stopped you from killing yourself? And I've had people tell me all kinds of things. You know, like, they, they, someone told me once they were getting ready to put the bottle of pills and her husband tackled them at the last moment. I mean, I've had people tell me they were going to run out in front of traffic, sit on a train track. And I'm not saying people haven't done that before, but if someone tells you they thought about running into traffic, it's usually malingers do that, um, to try to get into a psychiatric hospital for a, a warm place to sleep. But, you know, but most people don't run out. If you're going to kill yourself, people go out and kill themselves. They go get a gun, they go buy rope, and they go hang themselves, or they go shoot themselves, or they take a lethal overdose. Um, but, these, but borderlines typically, like I said, these are parasuicidal gestures. But again, they're very impulsive, so they could do any number of things, so you have to take their suicidal threats you know, seriously. And again, chronic feelings of emptiness and the good defense mechanism of splitting. Dr. Pierce is the great doctor. I'm the worst doctor in the world kind of thing, okay? And that's probably true, but, uh, but the borderlines would, would really use that to their advantage. Dependent personality disorder, you'll see this a lot in your practice. You know, folks that, you know, if, say you're trying to give informed consent and they're just overly relying on you to make the decision for them. Um, so these, these people don't like conflict um, and what I call codependency. And you see this, these people are typically folks who are married. The, the easiest example is someone who's married to an alcoholic uh, or has been married to several alcoholics, uh, typically a female, uh, at least in my experience, um, and they don't leave the relationship. They just stay and stay and stay uh, because they, they need that relationship to fulfill their own dysfunction, really. But these folks, do, do they, they can get better uh, with good treatment. And antisocial people are some of my favorite folks in the world. These are sociopaths, okay? Uh, now, we don't meet the, 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 the famous ones, the, the Ted Bundys, uh, the Charles Manson. In fact, did you guys hear that Charles Manson's getting married? Isn't that amazing? A 20-year-old woman's going to marry Charles Manson. I thought, good grief. It makes you feel bad when Charles Manson can get a date with a 20-year-old and you can't. You know, it's like um, something's wrong with the, the world. Um, so anyway, these are the deceitful ones. These are con artists. Um, and they don't have any regard for, safe, for the safety of others. Uh, they have lack of remorse. They really don't have a good uh, formed superego, which is basically the guilt center. And I always say that these are the used car salesmen. These are the hustlers of the world. Okay, now, that doesn't mean everyone who's a hustler is a sociopath or whatever, and some people are manipulative and hustlers in a good way. Um, some people might say Bill Clinton was a hustler in his own right. Uh, some people said Jesus Christ may have been an antisocial. You know, you know, if psychiatry saw Jesus today, they'd say he's antisocial because uh, he's a hustler. He was able to grab lots of people <laughs> and get them to believe into something that he had to sell. So um, 
the used car sales, and that's probably shouldn't have said that, but uh, you get the point. <laughs> these are folks like us, obsessive compulsive personality, and again, these are the perfectionists. And again, it's a good thing to have in some ways. If you're if you're a physician, it's not a bad trait to to be very vigilant. Um, I like I like working with Dr. Capilla because she has a little bit of OCD in her. She's very vigilant. She's very hyper vigilant sometimes. Uh, but I like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's good working with someone who you know is going to get the job done, who's going to look over the orders and double look over the orders, make sure the discharge summary was done, the medications were all, you know, it's, it's a lot to do to admit someone and to discharge someone. So it takes a little bit of obsessive compulsive traits. And I wouldn't say she has the disorder or personality. I'm just saying that we all have some of the traits. Okay. And she's not really inflexible, though. That's, you're not inflexible. <laughs> I'm just, this, this is the disorder, okay? But if you have someone who has really obsessive, compulsive personality disorder, they're very inflexible. It can be hard to really change their mind about anything, even if it's detrimental to them. Now, somatoform disorders. The, these, these types you will see. And these types, you're gonna, they'll be in your clinic. Now, you may have help, and you may need people to help you treat them. But these folks you're going to have. You're going to see these. And, I can, I can bet money that people have seen conversion. Has anyone seen conversion disorder? Or at least they thought they saw conversion disorder. Yeah. Um, you know, hypochondriacs, I mean, I've seen some hypochondriacs in the, in the, uh, in the psych hospitals. Um, body dysmorphic, you know, we've seen those people. If you did a, if you did a month with Stuart Light, um, aside from seeing narcissism, you'll see, you know, uh, body dysmorphic syndrome. Factitious and malingering we'll cover just briefly just to kind of make sure you guys have it in your brains what the difference is, okay? I wouldn't worry too much about it, but just so you know what the difference is, just to reinforce it. But uh, this is what Dr. Locke's going to see when she uh, gets into the GI business. She's going to see uh, a history of many physical complaints prior to the age of 30, four pain symptoms, and then and the two GI symptoms, okay? The abdominal bloating, the abdominal pain, one or the other, uh, spastic colon, whatever the case may be, she will see this disorder. Uh, there's going to be a sexual symptom and a so-called pseudo-neurological symptom. It could be numbness, and it could be actual neurological symptom. Again, these folks are not faking anything. They actually had the symptoms. And the difference between this um, and, and other, the other ones is that, or like hypochondriasis, for instance, is um, these folks are focused on the symptoms. Okay, they're not saying, Doc, I have a brain tumor, or Doc, I, have, I know I've got an abdominal cancer. That's a hypochondriac. The headache is brain cancer for sure. But these folks may have headaches. Okay, they may have some numbness. They may have urinary frequency, all the kind of things that we're talking about here, and some kind of pain symptom, maybe fibromyalgia. They may have a history of fibromyalgia. Um, but regardless of all that, you, you should investigate what's going on. So, again, don't, don't ever call me and say, I've got, I've got somebody for you, and you haven't done your investigation. I'll, I'll get upset. Uh, I've gotten upset before. I've gotten calls from a fellow psych re or internal medicine resident calling me to see someone for this kind of thing. Uh, it's like you have to do the workup. Now, the treatment for these folks is frequent visits with you. <laughs> That's the treatment. And actually, the psychiatry res uh, recommends every two weeks. So be coming to see Jack every two weeks. So uh, what do you think of that? That's tough. I've got, I've got these kind of patients in my clinic, and they wear me down. They wear me out. Because they want, man, they want me so badly to get that CT scan. They want so badly to see Dr. Stewart because they think they have diabetes and they don't. Uh, they want so bad to see Dr. Locke and her crew. Uh, they, they want a colonoscopy bad. And uh, they want everything done. But, again, you have to be resilient to these folks. You learn to say no to folks. You can do it in a nice way. And most of the patients that I've diagnosed with uh, somatization disorder, they're usually mad at me when I tell them that. 
because they'll go home and read what somatization disorder is, and they'll say, oh, it's in my head, you don't believe me, and they'll give me all that stuff. And usually I know these people, and I listen to what they say. And I say, no, I don't believe you're making it up. I think it's real, but I can't find anything on, on these exams. And what, if I keep doing, if someone keeps doing CT scans, invasive things, something bad's going to happen. So you just have to work with them. Uh, and also, these folks probably need a therapist. They need someone to talk to as well, or they'll, they'll wear you out as well in addition, but frequent appointments with their primary care doctor, and probably, you know, making sure you're in contact. I've, I've, the best success I've had with a, um, with a somatization disorder patient when I was actually seeing him as a psych doc was I called their primary care doctor and said, hey, what do you think about this? And they, they were like, they were so glad to hear from me. <laughs> they were worn out, and so we worked together. So it's always good when, medic, when doctors work together. You always get good results for patients. Here's the one we see a lot. I've seen it in the hospital quite a bit. One or more symptoms of deficits affecting voluntary sensory functions, and it suggests a neurological or other general medical condition. It doesn't have to be a neurological, but typically this is what I see. I've seen folks with complete right-sided you know, paralysis. Uh, I've actually discharged people with complete right side. I had them in a wheelchair and I wheeled them out the door. People thought I was crazy, but I did it. Uh, but this person had had, I think the resident totaled up 20 to 30 admissions in a year. And in one year had nearly 50, 50 imaging studies. Okay, so these people, they're the ones that have all these studies and nothing's wrong. So nothing could, could, could prove that this was a stroke um, although she had, she certainly had risk factors. She was a very uncontrolled diabetic. She had risk factors for stroke, but she wasn't having a stroke when I saw her with a complete right sided. What was going on was she had a, a daughter that was a drug addict. Financial situations, a very you know, a very dysfunctional home life that she needed to get away from, and she didn't have the coping skills to just you know do what you or I would do, just you know, take a vacation or. Um, get out of the situation or just not tolerate certain behaviors. She didn't have those kind of coping skills or support network. And that's what you'll see a lot of times. These people don't have the support network. So remember, these symptoms are not intentionally produced and they cannot be fully explained by any kind of general medical condition or imaging study, okay? That's conversion disorder. But it does cause significant stress, distress, okay? So these people are distressed by this. So there needs to be some compassion uh, but there also needs to be some honesty in the discussion. You need to tell them uh, in, a, in a kind way that nothing's been found. Um, and then when nothing's been found, then you can start asking questions like, what's going on at home or is there anything going on? Is there any stress in your life? You know, um, things like that. Or you can get a psychiatry consult, which is what a lot of people do, and that's fine too. Hypochondriasis, I think we all pretty much got an idea of this. Uh, are there any medical students in here? You know, medical students tend to be hypochondriacs. Huh? Uh, they, uh, they start reading about disorders. You know, my daughter's a medical student, and so she's, began, she's sort of a hypochondriac in a way. Um, she'll have all these brain tumors or this or that. Um, and I just say, oh, you don't. That's why your dad should never be your doctor. I just dismiss everything. Um, again, these do cause uh, significant distress. Um, and he, Actually, I, I saw a gentleman when I was a medical student with hypochondriasis, and he was basically just extremely obsessed with his bowels. He, th he thought he basically had some kind of cancer, was causing constipation. He had worked up near a facility back in Indiana where there was you know, possibly radiation and all kinds of stuff that were, they were dumping out, you know, bad chemicals and things, so he was certain that his former employer had caused it, and regardless of what we did, nothing mattered. No matter what we said to this guy, there was always some other ex explanation for why he was constipated or why he had a tumor, and he always wanted us to do more imaging. This guy, he was really debilitated. So someone who's been to the plastic surgeon a lot, Stuart Light, and old Michael Jackson. Anybody remember when Michael Jackson looked like this? Anybody old enough to remember Michael Jackson on the right here? Yeah, I am. He was 
very ta- I mean, Michael Jackson's a talented guy, but this is what he looked like. This is the transformation, and I think Michael Jackson's probably your classic body dysmorphic syndrome, and it comes from a lot of underlying psychiatric issues. Um, now, just again, like I said, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page, malingering is for secondary gain. Now, somebody asked me the other day, and it's, and it's a good point, well, don't uh, the factitious people get secondary gain? And the answer is yes, they do. I mean, factitious folks um, are intentionally producing um, some kind of disease. I mean, and the classic one is, the classic question is a nurse injecting yourself with fecal matter in, under the skin causing skin infections. I mean, that's the classic one. Someone taking diabetic medications to cause hypoglycemia. Doctor, I'm sure Dr. Stewart has seen this before. Um, so when you're looking at questions or, where you're li- or when you're getting a history from somebody, malingering is someone like who's avoiding prosecution, typically. They're, they're, they're going to check themselves into a psychiatric hospital. I used to have this with a patient who would check himself. He would, a court date would come up, and all of a sudden he would have a psychotic break, and he would check into the psychiatric hospital, and then um, uh, he would need me to write a letter. Now, once he did this three times, he, I asked him, I said, well, can I, get the, um, the, uh, can I get you to sign some releases so I can do this for you? And sure enough, he signed the release to the sheriff department and everything else, the probation officer. So when I called the sheriff's office and said, hey, I've got you know, Jack Smith here in the office with me or the psychiatric, they're, they were like, oh, really? We're looking for him. And they actually came and got him. So uh, he didn't actually get out of it, but... Um, but those are people who are trying to get out of some kind of trouble versus the, the, the factitious folks who are just trying to intentionally produce these symptoms. Okay, so just remember secondary gain for malingers uh, and factitious patients, in, somewhere in the health care field intentionally producing uh, the symptoms that you're going to find. Just a quick mention of dementia. I mean, we're... You guys are going to see, I mean, if you haven't already, you're going to start seeing, a, there's a lot of old people, if you haven't noticed, that come to hospitals. There are going to be even more older people that are coming to hospital with one type or another of dementia. It could be Alzheimer's, uh, or it could be vascular uh, dementia. There's other kinds of dementia, but these are two that I see quite a bit. And I just wanted to mention just a few things, you know, just the denipazil and memantine, which are the two drugs that, that um, uh, that are typically seen, uh, Exelon patches or another, uh, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. The memantine is the MDMA receptor antagonist. And again, denipazil, uh, and again, I, you know, I, I see primary care doctors actually prescribing this. Um, and again, that's for the, the milder cases of, of dementia. Now, there are high doses of Aricept that are being given for more uh, severe dementia. Uh, I don't typically use that um, as far as that goes, but memantine is for more severe. So if you see someone who's on, you see someone who's on memantine, you know they're on, uh, they're, they have severe dementia. So if you see a CT scan with ischemic changes in the deep white matter, that's, that's vascular dementia, okay? That's vascular dementia. And again, the risk factors for Alzheimer's, you know, the APOE uh, allele, um, genetic testing for Alzheimer's, um, hypertension. Or, there's all kinds of things that they say are risk factors uh, for Alzheimer's uh, disease. I see things written every day, but these are things you see quite often. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia are the ones you see for um, vascular dementia. These are some of the drugs you see. Um, the older ones, the Prozacs, the Paxils, Luvox, which you see for um, obsessive compulsive disorders, so you, don't, you don't, probably won't use that a whole lot. The drugs I typically use are Celexa. And the reason why I use Celexa is it's good for anxiety and depression, and they have a low side effect profile. So if you have to choose an SSRI, I would choose Celexa. Now, if they've got good insurance, and they, maybe they do have generalized anxiety disorder in addition, go ahead and give them Lexapro if you want. But Lexapro sometimes makes people sleepy. So I, I typically use Celexa, uh, Citalopram, um, GI, sexual sedation, some of them have. Uh, side effects will occur. Uh, but always try to remember the timing. 
So, so, so Prozac, for instance, that's going to take four to six weeks to get up to a, uh, a therapeutic level. Um, Selexa may be actually a little bit quicker, two to four weeks. Okay, but always maximize the dose. Uh, we're going to do the um, board review course. I'll talk more about the STAR D trial, but um, you know, as far as evidence based medicine goes in psychiatry, uh, a lot of it seems like witchcraft, but this is STAR D trial is actually evidence based, and, it's, and they, they, like to, they like for you to know that on your board exam. Okay, we'll talk more about that later on. Some of these, Cymbalta, you got someone with diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And, you want to, and they're depressed, that's a drug to use. Venlafaxine is the same. It's an SNRI, uh, so that, it's a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Uh, there's others, Pristique, which is basically um, a drug very similar to venlafaxine. It just doesn't have to pass through the liver. Uh, Vibrid or Velazidone uh, is the newest drug on the market, and they say it doesn't have as many uh, GI uh, or sexual side effects. You got someone who's young, they don't have a seizure disorder, they don't have an eating disorder, bupropion. If they have attention, focus problems, energy issues, use Wellbutrin. We'll talk more about that later. An older person, can't sleep, poor appetite, mirtazapine's a great drug, but remember metabolic syndrome. If you need a sleeping medication and you don't want to prescribe Ambien, try Trazodone. Okay? It's, it's a horrible antidepressant, but it works real well for uh, sleep. I get a lot of mileage out of doxepin. Now, you've got to be careful. It's a TCA, so you get the, the dry mouth, all the, the side effects that you get uh, with TCAs, and anticholinergic side effects. Um, but those are drugs you can use as well. But those are drugs you'll see. And if you've got a patient who's on doxepin or amyltryptyline and they have dementia, I'd get them off of it, okay, because it can cause more problems. These are just some things, just a mood stabilizer to think about, thyroid and renal impairment and lithium, uh, hepatic function. Uh, if you've got someone who's just started um, Depakote and they're lethargic, delirious, check an ammonia level, okay? It might be elevated, and they might need to get off that Depakote. With atypicals, remember metabolic syndrome. Remember QTC prolongation and the black box warning in dementia, okay? So with these atypicals um, and typical antipsychotics, you got to remember about the black box warning when you give it to a demented patient. Or if it's being given to a demented patient, it can cause cardiovascular or cerebral vas vascular events. So you got to be careful when you're given these kind of medications. Sometimes you have to, uh, but re please remember metabolic syndrome. These are the things that imitate psychiatric disorders. I've actually had people in, the, uh, in Woodridge before who, ha who actually had Graves' disease. I, I was called to go see them. They had Graves' disease. They were in there for bipolar disorder. And maybe they had bipolar disorder, but they also had Graves' disease, and they were also a cocaine addict. <laughs> so I don't know if they were bipolar or not. Uh, so anyway, steroid-induced uh, mania. Um, Dr. Patel and I just presented a paper in Dallas, or a poster, rather, uh, about a um, uh, lupus cerebritis case uh, where we gave them steroids. And our, our question was, did the steroids cause the manic episode, or was it the fact that she had lupus cerebritis? Actually, Dr. Pierce saw the case as well and transferred it over to the John City Medical Center so she'd get better care um, with uh, psychiatry on board. B12 deficiency, actually, Dr. Pierce and I saw a patient years ago who had a B12 deficiency and was psychotic and paranoid. Uh, we did a, pay, uh, a poster on that as well. So there's all kinds of things that can present in a psychiatric case. They, 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 everyone thought it was MS but end up being a B12 deficient. This, per, this person had pernicious anemia, okay? HIV-related dementia or AIDS mania, I've seen that. Brain tumors, people hallucinate, uh, and again, lupus cerebritis. If you're going to do a consult, please give an indication. Let the person know, and this goes for everything. Every consult you give or you order, make sure that you, you give an indication for why. These are your community resources. Woodridge Hospital is the one here. If you're, I, don't, I guess we don't go out to uh, Bristol anymore very often anyway, but if you do, if you are out in Bristol for ICU, uh, 5 East in Bristol, I think still, still operates out there, so if you need psychiatric inpatient, that's where to go. The crisis stabilization units here in town, you can get either Respond uh, or Mobile Crisis. Don't worry about which one's which. They'll figure that out for you, but just order a Respond consult. Patient is medically stable. Always put patient is medically stable. They won't come see the person if you don't write that, okay? 
So write the consult when the patient is medically stable and make sure you say they're medically stable. Uh, they can get them to the crisis stabilization unit, which is sort of like a three-day, very relaxed environment, therapeutic deal, medication adjustments, all kinds of stuff. Woodridge is the lockdown. Magnolia Ridge is the only 21-day program we got in this town for substance abuse, particularly opiate abuse, but they actually do alcohol dependence as well. If you work in our clinic or if you're working at the medical center, Susan Fields, okay, if you need a counselor, if someone needs a counselor, get them to see Susan Fields. Sometimes it's better to get someone to a counselor versus getting them to a psychiatrist. You know, it takes a, a lot to get someone to see me. Let them see Susan Fields if you need someone in our clinic or you're working at the med center and they need a counselor, okay? And then Dr. Eric Roth, if you, if you need psych, uh, neuropsychiatric testing or evaluations, so you've got a demented patient, you want to ferret out some things, get Roth to do it. So, summarizing this, please recognize common psychiatric conditions in both settings. Treat when appropriate. Uh, be aware of medications and side effects. Target patient symptoms with certain medications. And again, always think of the possible physiological causes of psychiatric illnesses. So you may need to order some labs. Again, CBC, TSH, if someone's down and low energy, it may, might be anemic. They might have hypothyroidism. They might be B12 deficient, okay? So the most useful strategy for individuals with, so this last question, the most useful treatment strategy for individuals with somatization disorder is either refer them to psychiatry, repeat, repeated abdominal contrast to CT scans for diffuse epigastric pain, or send them to Dr. Locke, frequent visits with PCP and contact with other health care providers, or confront the patient about their multiple physical complaints that are not substantiated with imaging studies. What do you guys say? It is C. Yeah, the word confront, now, if that word were different, that might be different, but it, whenever you see the word confront in a, in a question or an answer, that's not the answer. <laughs> All right, I guess I got to go, guys. Good seeing you.